So, as you may recall, we had uh, in the past, we were working with the discrete time Fourier transform, which was defined as a sum over all time, x of n, e to the negative j, omega n. And there we go, you, you have the spectrum. Um, however, we've discussed that this is not very practical. We would rather have something computable. And so we came up with the uh, discrete time or discrete Fourier transform as opposed to the discrete time Fourier transform. We now have discrete frequencies and the sum is done over a discrete period. Instead of omega, it's 2 pi over n times nk. So there's our DFT. Well, so now we can do uh, spectral analysis, but it's on a finite length signal. So we're going to look at the example of a noise signal. And then we'll look at an example of when x is a tone and investigate different uh, options for doing with this. So first we'll look at x of n is equal to, using MATLAB notation here, um, rand n, some length, potentially infinite. Don't do this at home. So, uh, because we're just dealing with uncorrelated random variables, we know that the uh, power spectral density is uh, going to be flat. And how do we know that? Well, remember we find our uh, autocorrelation value. And me. Um, we find that V XX, since it's stationary, we can um, we don't have to, we just worry about the separation. We get the expected value of x n, expected value star x n plus m. But since this is real, we don't really care about uh, that aspect of it. And this is just going to be delta of m times the variance of m um, because we're zero mean. We don't have any of that to worry about, so there we go. And so um, we can find the power spectral density as the sum over all time of delta m sigma x squared e to the negative j omega m. Well, everything goes away from that sum except for the single term when m is equal to zero. And so we just get a constant. So if we were to plot omega here, the PSD is just going to be a constant as sigma x squared. So we would like to do and find the same thing as uh, a DFT. But we can't do the DFT on the entire sequence, so we're just going to do it on the window. Remember, we've already broken up our signal into frames when we did our convolution. So now we'll do the same type of idea, and we're going to introduce uh, this window notation uh, to kind of formalize it. And so we'll just say that uh, we're going to do this in two steps. First, we want the uh, PSD estimated from a small and short section. So we need to isolate that section. So we could say this. Now remember, the problem we had before was that we cannot take the Fourier transform of a noise sequence. Because the noise sequence goes on forever, it has infinite energy. 
And so if you try to sum something with infinite energy, uh, it won't converge. And so we had to do this backdoor approach and say, well, let's find the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation, and that should give us something that looks like power. And we called it our power spectral density. And then to verify that this worked, we actually found that in the case where you do have sequences that converge, doing this does give you the same thing as if you just took the power or the uh, spectrum uh, magnitude squared. So it all works out. And so we can go back and do the simple way, at least as a starting point. Okay, so we've taken our same original sequence. Uh, in fact, I think I should probably um, go back to where I defined x of k and put a little n down there to indicate that that's a short version. Okay, so now we have our original sequence, but we're only going to sum over the first capital N samples. So how do we do that? Um, we can actually sum over all samples and just multiply it by Wn, where Wn is going to be zero, except except where we're interested. Okay, so that looks like n equals zero, n minus one, x of n, wn minus j omega n. You know what? I just wrote that. Except zero less than equal to n. Okay, that should be clear. Now, the easiest w that we could decide or use would be just to make it one in that range and zero everywhere else. The easiest wn is wn is equal to one. over uh, the range where we're taking our DFT, and zero everywhere else. Okay, so we actually, we were talking about taking the DFT, and we're setting it up as if we're taking the DFT, but we haven't yet quite reached that point. Uh, why? It's because we have an omega there instead of a K. But now that we have a short sequence, we can go ahead and sample at the frequencies of interest. Okay. Well, it turns out that uh, now we would have vk is equal to sum equals 0 to n minus 1, xn, wn, e, negative j, 2 pi, n, k, over n. There we go. So the big question is, all this looks really straightforward, but how useful is this? And what do we do about that W? Where does it come in? We're going to talk about the W more in just a bit. It'll really become apparent when we start looking at uh, tones. But for the noise, um, how well does this work? Well, in one sense, it works perfectly. It does exactly what the math tells it it will do. Uh, but the question is, how close is v of k to uh, a sampled version of our original unwindowed um, power spectral density? So the question is, how well does vk match our predicted power spectral density? We already predicted that power spectral density was going to be um, this sigma x squared, as shown up above. And since we're just sampling the power spectral density, we would expect to get something pretty close to that. Well, 
we've got several things going on. One, as you might expect, since we're not looking at a full section of the signal, what we might get might not match it perfectly. And uh, two, the power spectral density is the uh, would be v squared, not uh, just v. So, okay. So let's put that down well. This part's the easy part. To estimate PSD. Okay, so assuming that we can do that, now it should match a little bit better. But let's go through a thought experiment. Let's go down to x of n being extremely short, one sample. Well, one sample is going to be noise. Um, yeah, well, it's all noise, but in other words, it could be anything. Um, it's going to have, we're going to get some sample, maybe it'll be zero, maybe it'll be plus one, maybe minus one, or whatever it may be. So taking the Fourier transform of that one sample is not, even if we square it, it's not likely to give us sigma x squared. So if we took two samples, I don't know, it's not going to likely give us the same constant value. So just in this thought experiment, we can see that taking a single sample is going to fail miserably. Taking a few, there's nothing that guarantees it would give us some constant transform. But we're hoping that as we go longer and longer and longer, that it'll give us a better value. So that's our hope. Um, let's see. So we know that very short x, no windows, won't give us sigma x squared. So how long do they have to be? So here is where things just stop working. Uh, let's try this. We're going to switch over to MATLAB for a few minutes and see what see what we can do. So you're in MATLAB. I have written this uh, function. It's partway written. We'll fill in details as we go. We're going to frequency analysis of noise. Okay, so we have several things going on. We're going to ignore the L for right now. We'll start out with the N. Um, and let's start with a, actually, let's copy this all so I don't overwrite what we're going to do in a bit. Get rid of the L. That, that, and that. Okay, so now we have this little section. We have 8,000 samples of noise. N is equal to 8,192. We do x equals to n. And just for kicks, I'm going to change that to a column vector. Now we're going to do the periodogram. So um, in this case, we're pretending that we have some infinite length x, and we've just pulled out 8,192 samples. And that our w function is a rectangular window. The rectangular window is the one that is ones, where it's non-zero, and zero everywhere else. So it just forms um, a simple box. We'll get to that part in a bit. OK, so now let's do figure plot wp comma px. OK, so this uh, function periodogram, what is it doing? Well, it's just multiplying the window times x, taking the Fourier transform, and squaring it, and normalizing it uh, by the length. And so let's see what happens when we run this section. The variance should be 1. The standard deviation should be 1. No, we're not getting that, are we? Um, let's see what happens if we go with something that's really short, say 32. Uh, that doesn't look good either. What's going on? Okay, let's try. There's a normalization that actually brings it down a little bit, and I did not 
put that in there, but we won't worry about it. Let's go. We did 32. Let's try 64. Run section. 64 is all over the place. Okay. Let's try 32, 768. And I'm choosing powers of 2 because it's using the FFT underneath. We want it to be very efficient. So what are we getting? We're getting something that is nowhere near the uh, flat value that we expect. It wasn't there when we did 32 samples or 64 or 8,000 or even 32,000. The samples are all over the place. And it turns out that it makes sense to you and I that if we were to increase the length of the noise that we look at, we're going to get a better estimate of the power spectrum. But what we end up getting is more estimates of the power spectrum, but they aren't better. The variance of each sample of our estimated power spectrum is um, just as high, no matter how many uh, samples we use in our computation. So what we wanted was um, something that came right down and was much more accurate. And what we ended up getting was something that was not more accurate. Rather, uh, it was just um, higher resolution. So the answer is going to be, let's go back to uh, using short ones. At least they're smoother. Um, we'll go back to using short ones. And from there, oops, let's close that. We will average a bunch of short ones together. So we take our original signal, uh, we divide it up into short segments, and we do the Fourier transform of each segment, and then we average them together. And so that's what this next little bit of code shows right here. So here we have 8,000 samples, like we started with up above. And we're going to take the Fourier transform of 64 sample blocks, and then we'll average those. So, let's see, we have 2 to the 13th, I believe, is 8,192, divided by 2 to the 6th. So, we're going to be averaging 2 to the 7th, or 128 samples. We would expect our variance to decrease uh, by a factor of, of uh, our sanity, yes, by a factor of 128. So, let's give this a shot and see what we get. section. Okay, right now there are two things going on here, and you should focus on what's going on in the left column. The value on your the upper left is the uh, Fourier transform, or the periodogram, uh, so the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform, uh, for the original 8,192 samples. And the index is normalized to go from 0 to pi, so we can compare. Uh, on the uh, lower section there, uh, we have instead done a shorter Fourier transform and averaged the results. And so now we're getting something that's much more close to a constant. Well, how many samples are we going to have to do to get it to constant? Let's, let's just try this times. 1024. It's going to take a little bit of time. And let's hope that the computer can keep up with me. I think I might put the lecture on pause while this happens. Okay, I'm back. It turns out that uh, 8 million samples was more than my little tablet liked. So I reduced that number to uh, 16 times uh, 8192. And we got something that's computable in a reasonable amount of time. You'll also notice something different, um, and that is now we see something approximating a variance of 1, like we anticipated. And that's because, as I mentioned, there was another scaling factor in P. Welch that, uh, in the periodogram that I had not accounted for. And that was these MATLAB functions take into account the sample frequency, so what they estimate is a sample frequency um, corrected estimate so that you could try to show the actual energy in particular frequency ranges from a real uh, continuous time sample signal. So let's let's take a look at uh, the end result here. So right now we're looking at uh, 64 frequencies. Uh, 
I specify the sample frequency to be 2, so that the highest frequency is 1, and that's why everything works out. Before, uh, without specifying that, the highest frequency was pi, and so all of our variances were divided by pi to give us um, the uh, power spectral density of the continuous time signal. It's not something you need to worry about too much right now, but uh, we'll uh, put the equations down for that when we go back. So we generated a random signal, and we took the f of t of that signal. Since this is um, a Gaussian random signal, when we take the FFT of it, we're going to get um, some randomly distributed outputs. And what we see here in the upper left is the result of that. And I'm going to zoom in because we have quite a few samples here. So we'll just zoom in on a very few of them. We'll have to do this a few times to see what's going on. Because we had so many examples sticking up what we now see is that, sure, it looks like the average might actually be near 1, but we have uh, samples near 0 and some that go all the way up to 5. So if we averaged many spectra, each taken over different sections of our waveform, we'd get something much smoother, as shown here. So while I talk, we will run this one more time and see what goes on. So the periodogram is the one that is just taking the FFT of the entire uh, vector multiplied by a window, which is just one. And P Welch is instead breaking it up into segments, taking the FFT of each one, finding the magnitude squared of each segment, and then averaging all the resulting uh, spectral magnitudes squared. And so that's why we get uh, uh, such a much smoother result. You might imagine if we just kept going this would get closer and closer to a constant 1 value. Another way to get there is to decrease the number of uh, frequency samples that we're taking, which will increase uh, the number of averages that we're taking. And so that'll once again run for a minute while I talk about the rest of this code. Um, I then filtered the signal with a, um, it was originally a low pass filter, but now I've modified it so it's a bandpass filter. This has a zero at omega equals zero and one at omega equals pi. The zeros at pi and pi. And we filter that and we take a periodogram of the output and we would expect it to be, since we're multiplying it by a power spectral density of one, we would expect it to look like the frequency response of that filter. And this will come up in just a moment. We can verify that that's the case. Um, when we look at the uh, Fourier transform of the whole noisy signal, that is not the case. When we look at the, uh, the Welch version, it is the case. It looks like we have a 0 at 1 and a 0 at 0. Now, it's going to be biased a little bit up um, because we're averaging powers. And the power is always going to be positive. And so it's hard to get it to average all the way down to zero unless you have an extraordinary number of samples that you're averaging. So there's that. But there's one thing I haven't told you about the Welch approach. And that is it's dividing the signal up into segments and taking the Fourier transform. But it turns out that we can actually reduce the variance by a factor of almost two if we divide it up into overlapping segments. So let's go back and put all this down uh, for posterity. Periodogram averaging. So that generally looks like we take our signal and we divide it up 
for each one of these. Compute FFT. And we find the magnitude squared. And then we'll do that all the way across. And then we average these. But Welch's method goes one step further. And uses and these segments. Basically, we have the segments we had before, but we add to it. these ones. And variance decreases further. Okay, so we're almost done with this. Let's uh, put down the equations for the periodogram and then or for the periodogram averaging and then I think we're done for the day by the way this is in the textbook in chapter 10 section 5 So, the way it's included in the text is, to, is defined in several sec sections, but in essence, we just say that uh, xr of uh, n, similar to what we did before, is going to be r times r plus n times WN this time. And then we can say VR is equal to oops, 1 over L U magnitude XR K squared and that should have a K. And then the average version, get rid of the R, is just going to be 1 over K times the sum R equals 0 to K of the R K. So we just have a few terms to define. 1, U, um, U normalizes the window. So every window is going to have its, um, you know, they may not all be ones, so we want the effect of the window to be averaged out. And that's going to be 1 over L times the sum n equals 0, L minus 1, W n squared. L, of course, is the FFT length and K is the number of frames or windows number of the R's computed. Okay, so now we have one other thing that's new, R is the what we call the window skip.
or step, which I think stride is a better. So what this is basically saying is we are going to grab L samples. So let's put this up on our original thing. That's L. But this quantity right here is R. So L is the length of the FFT that we're taking, and R is how far we step before we grab another L samples. So there we go. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.